Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, Dave Mullen, who's been a member, I think he just joined very recently, uh, offered to talk, and his talk is going to be on AARP. Uh, Dave Mullen worked for IBM in marketing for about 39 years, and he specialized in training and teaching, both internally and externally, on various management topics. In his career, he gave over 2,000 speeches, so it, this should be a pretty good one. He has been with AARP since 2003. He was president from 2012 to 2018, so he should know a lot. And I'm sure most of us have been members for years, at least I have, but most of us are unaware of the many benefits and services that AARP offers. Thank you, David, for enlightening us. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, okay, and thank you, Joel, for bringing the charts up. Um, just to give you a little bit more about my background in AARP, as John said, I joined in, uh, in uh, 2003. I immediately got involved in the Speakers Bureau because speaking is really my career more than anything else. Um, and after a few years, I was asked to help redesign the Speakers Bureau. And I'm gonna tell you more about the current Speakers Bureau after a little bit. Uh, and then somehow I got to be president and I was president six years and was working literally seven days a week on it. Uh, after I uh, got out, out of being president, I, um, they don't ever let anybody go. So I'm still active, but I'm not nearly as active as, for example, Ken Lindhorst is. And since he is not only old guard, but he's the guy who brought me to old guard, even though he's not with us today, uh, I'm going to tell you some of the things that Ken is doing because they're very relevant, very important things that's going on. Um, secondly, uh, the point about not knowing what AARP offers. We are not an insurance company. We don't sell any insurance at all of any kind. There seems to be confusion about that, and I've gotten myself in some interesting spots, like when a woman called up and asked me to come to one of the active adult communities in Monroe, and uh, she was going to have the Blue Cross person there, and we were going to compete and talk about our insurance. And I tried to explain to her that I don't sell insurance, but I didn't get too far, so I just didn't go. So I'm going to tell you what ARP really is, what ARP does, why we do it, and how everybody benefits from what we do. Uh, the question came up during the preparation for this about questions. Ask questions whenever you like. Um, I've been at this a long time. Don't worry. Ask me during the presentation. Ask me at the end. I don't care. Okay. Uh, let's skip, Joel, let's skip the second chart and go to the third chart. Okay. Thank you. The basics of AARP, we are really independent. I, this is a really important point. Um, we are nonprofit, that should be obvious, and we're membership based, and that should be obvious. But the nonpartisan, when I first joined AARP, I, uh, I was very surprised by that because we're all conditioned by the media to think that everything on earth is partisan. And I couldn't understand why AARP is partisan. And the reason is, that it gives you a lot of power. It's amazing to me how well it works. Uh, we will work with any politician on any side who will support our objectives. That's how we do it. And the politicians are very appreciative and they're very um, willing to work with us. Okay, uh, we're over 50 years old uh, and people 50 and over are our priority. Uh, Let's talk about this thing about membership. Um, and this is very, I, I had a lot of experience with this point. We have 38 million members and more than 1,300 chapters in the country, 1.2 million members in New Jersey and 40 chapters in New Jersey. It's a lot of people. We do a lot of uh, working with other organizations uh, to achieve our goals. And I have to tell you, when we are working with the other nonprofits, and there are many in New Jersey we work with, we are pretty much the elephant in the room because we're really the biggest. Uh, we can talk about why, but the fact is we are the biggest and everybody treats us that way. 
Okay, let's go to the next chart. Um, the mission. Uh, I don't think there's anything surprising there. Uh, driving social change. Driving social change. And we do that organizationally. We do it legally. It says advocating. Uh, there is a, a word in English for advocate. The word is lobbying. And we will talk about lobbying as we go along. Uh, we have a lot of parts to ARP. An organization that big has a lot of parts. Uh, in addition to AARP proper, the, the main organization, there is an organization called the AARP Foundation, which is a charitable organization that raises funds and helps the poor. There is legal counsel for the elderly, which sees to the legal rights of seniors in Washington. And there's AARP services, and I'll talk more about that later. And that's the part of AARP that works with vendors who sell products with our name on them. And that's why people think we sell insurance. Um, if you watch those ads on TV, you will notice that health insurance is sold by United Healthcare, not by AARP. Uh, we'll talk about that as we go along. Okay, next chart. Okay, uh, we have a significant part of our effort is done by volunteers. By the way, it is not all done by volunteers and I'll talk more about that later, but you should know that we, I don't know the number of staff. I think I remember a number like 2000, but I'm not sure about that. It's a very large national staff. There is a state office in every state in the union plus Washington and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, I think it is. So there are 53 state offices. Each one of them has a paid staff and has volunteers. The volunteers are guided by the national organization, but are independent in the chapters. And they do social or civic things. You go around New Jersey, uh, for example, you'll see a lot of uh, senior centers. And ARP chapter, the local chapter, will be very active in them. Uh, doing uh, charitable drives like coat drives or food drives. Uh, and in addition, of course, it's very social. Uh, we also have these volunteer community teams um, who go out and provide services um, guided by the state office. Things like uh, special events, information forums, uh, those kinds of things um, are part of what we do. Let's go to the next chart and I'll tell you a little bit more. I mentioned civic and social activities. We are trying to foster well-being and combat social isolation. Notice that right block there. Social iso isolation is associated with $6.7 billion, billion in addition, in additional Medicare spending. Uh, social isol isolation is a tremendous problem with tremendous health uh, ramifications. By the way, Speaking of that, I don't want to get off topic, but I do want to tell you under the heading of social iso isolation that my wife and I live at Lantern Hill that works real hard on that subject too. Um, the volunteer community teams, we have them in Middlesex, in Bergen and Hudson. They do things like yoga classes, Zumba classes, virtual cooking classes, fraud workshops. And I'm going to talk quite a bit more about fraud. It's a very important topic and very important in AARP. Um, let's see if I want to do a little more over here. Um, I should say to you about my being a volunteer and Ken being a volunteer. That's where Ken and I met, and we have been friends since then. So we've been to friends for 18 years. Um, and you don't stay in an organization for 18 years if you're not getting something out of it. Yeah, it's a wonderful organization to work for. Okay, let's go to the next. Oh, before we go to the next chart, wait. Um, a new organization, besides the chapters and besides the volunteer community teams, is the Congressional Volunteer Corps, and Ken head, heads that one. Ken is actually much more active than I am right now. The Congressional Volunteer Corps is about 35 volunteers who are organized by congressional district. 
and whose job it is to work with that congressional office, with the staff and with the congressperson, working on building relationships, working on advocacy, or as I said before in English, called lobbying and on issues. And I will tell you quite a bit more about some very specific issues as we go along. But Ken does that, and it's a very, very impressive organization. Next chart, Joel, please. Okay. Uh, then we have a lot of community outreach besides what I mentioned before about the community service organization. Uh, we have the Speakers Bureau, which I introduced a little bit before. If you look there, um, this is a hint. Uh, Old Guard that is looking for speakers, they have, uh, the, the Speakers Bureau has volunteer speakers available to talk to you on topics like those. And I'll put up the website for that at the end so you'll know how you can contact them. But if you look at those topics, you'll see that we are on the ball, that we, uh, our speakers are talking about things that people care about uh, at our age. Okay, uh, next topic. We're gonna talk about tax aid now, and people don't know about this program. Uh, this is a very different thing. We actually offer volunteer tax return preparers to anyone anyone will get a free return done. But the special focus, of course, is on people over 50 and people with low to moderate incomes. We serve about two and a half million people a year nationwide. And in 2019, we, our work resulted in $1.4 billion in income tax refunds and $200 million in earned income tax credits. We are very proud of this. Uh, this is led by IRS trained and certified volunteers. So we work with the IRS on this. Okay, um, next chart, please. Some more community outreach. I mentioned before the issue about fraud and I, I wanna talk some more about that with you. Um, Fraud is a ferocious problem. I bet everybody knows that. And I have to tell you my own experience in the last couple of days. In the last couple of days, um, I got, I was preparing for this morning. So I was going over this material. I have worked in uh, the area of fraud for AARP and I was reminded of what I had done. I saw a document that was helping me. And yet last night I got caught. Now, I think I got out of it pretty well, but I got caught. It is very easy to get caught in what's going on uh, with fraud. Uh, and the Fraud Watch Network, you'll notice there is the website if you're looking for information on it. Um, it's an online service available to everybody. One of the things about AARP is we don't do a lot of uh, meeting fees or entrance fees or anything like that. Everything is open to members and non-members. Um, tips to spot and avoid scams, resources and updates. The watchdog alerts are uh, email documents, and then there's a scam tracking them so they can track where the spams are kind of coming from and how they're moving along. Now, what else? I mean, part of it is we all have to be very aware of fraud. We have to be smart about how we avoid it, how we fix things when they go wrong, and that's what the Fraud Not Watch Network is about. But what else? What else can we do? The New Jersey Identity Theft Pre Prevention Act, and that happened when I was president, so I worked on it. Uh, you may know this. If a thief gets your social security number, the, th the thief can go to a car dealer and say, uh, I'd like a car, and I'd like it on credit. And, the, and here's my social security number, and the car dealer goes in, uh, to the credit reporting agencies and finds out your credit is good. And lo and behold, you have bestowed on the thief a brand new car. That's what was happening. So what we did about that is the New Jersey Identity Theft Prevention Act. 
what happens is you can freeze your, your credit identity, which I have done. You tell the three credit reporting agencies, there are only three in the country, you tell them that you do not want anybody to be able to see your reports. That means that if the thief, even if the thief gets your social security number, when the thief goes to the car dealer and the car dealer tries to get the report, the car dealer can't get it. What about if it's you and you really want to buy the car? Are you going to go in there and you're, they're not going to be able to get to your report? Well, the answer is you can unfreeze and then refreeze. And as I remember, the total fee for that is $5. Uh, so you unfreeze your uh, credit report. The uh, car dealer looks at it, grants you the credit, and then you refreeze your report. That's how that law works. Uh, and it's available for everybody in New Jersey. And I was asked on the TV program, what if you're shopping in Virginia? And the answer is it doesn't go by where you're shopping. It goes by where you live. So as a New Jersey resident, you have that protection. And AARP did a lot to make that happen. The next one is this TRACE Act. Uh, you know, we all know about robocalls. And we all hate robocalls. Well, the truth is that there are robocalls we like. The ones from our town that tell us there's going to be a, a weather emergency. The ones from the utility company that says the power is going to be down. So there are good robocalls. The problem with robocalls is the fraud people. Now, if they call you with their phone number, you're very likely to see it on your caller ID and not accept the call. So what they do is they call it spoofing. They're able through some technology to get a phone number in your area code. I bet you all of you have been stuck by this and you think it's a local call and you pick it up and lo and behold, it's somebody trying to sell you something or somebody trying to per perpetrate a fraud. Uh, this act expands the FCC's ability to go after fraudulent robocallers, not all robocallers, by using the best technology available to identify when numbers have been spoofed uh, and outlaws the spoofing so that they can the, the FCC can go after them and punish them. Okay, uh, next chart. These are the kinds of things that AARP works on. Uh, let's go to the one after that. I think we don't need that one. Okay, thank you. The next one I want to talk about, and I have had personal experience with this, is the driver safety program. There is a smart driver course, and it's offered in the classroom and online. And uh, of course, during the pandemic, it wasn't offered in the classroom. I don't know if they've restarted the classroom once, but it is offered online. Um, and if you haven't taken it, it's really terrific. It really is. And they charge like $16, something like that, or $18. And you take this course and you have to take tests on it and so on. And I, as I remember, it was about eight hours or 16 hours and something like that. Um, and you qualify for a discount on your insurance for three years and you can get up to two points removed from your record. As a result, we don't just get old people, we get young people, as you might imagine, who take the course. My wife and I took it. We got um, insurance reductions. Works great. Uh, and you really learn things that are really helpful. Um, then we talk about CarFit. And CarFit is a free program where a member of a specially trained team uh, does a comprehensive 12-point check on how you fit in your car. Can you see over the hood? Is the headrest in the right position? Are the mirrors in the right position? It's a really good program that you can get. Just go on the web and you can get access to that program. The last one is a painful one. We need to talk. This is a seminar that helps you recognize when a loved one needs to stop driving and helps you deal with that loved one uh, about that. It's a very painful difficult subject, as you might imagine, one that's very important to us. So 
we want to make people better drivers and then there's an appropriate time for the driving to stop. And this uh, seminar will help you with that. Any questions so far? I am either the fount of clarity or the fount of boring. I don't know which one it does, but tell me later. Okay. David? Uh, yeah. Uh, Mitch Erickson here. Uh, I'm just curious, back a couple of slides, you had something about uh, lobbying for different things, and you cited the example of the uh, FCC defending against robocallers. Yeah. Now, I'm, f I'm all for that. But hypothetically, let's say I, I wasn't particularly keen on that one for whatever reason. Who gets to decide uh, which policies you guys, we all, since I'm a member, and do I get a vote? Okay, that's an interesting question. You don't really get a vote. Um, what happens is that the state staff decides on a program um, of lobbying for the year. Uh, at the beginning of the year, and the national does the same thing. There is a lot of member input into all that. There's a lot of member input because they talk a lot with the volunteers about it, but they don't go out and do, as I said, we have 1.2 million members in New Jersey. There is not a polling of the 1.2 million members. On the other hand, as you might imagine, we have no trouble hearing from people. Uh, you're not going to agree with everything. I didn't as president. The, the, in fact, the question is asked when you interview for president, uh, what do you do if you don't agree with our policies? Because nobody agrees with all of them. In my case, I have not had a policy yet that I disagree with. What I have disagreed with is some of the advertising. I don't think they do a good job in advertising is partly my business, but that's my opinion, not necessarily theirs. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Dave, uh, uh, going back to the New Jersey Identity Theft Protection Act, where you can uh, freeze your credit reports and then unfreeze them if you need to, um, I'm, I'm always concerned about how much hassle these things are. What would be your advice? Should we simply go ahead as a matter of course and freeze our credit reports just to be safe and then unfreeze it as necessary? Yeah, that's a, that's a hell of a question. I didn't do it when, it, when the <laughs> law first went into effect. And after a while, I began hearing more horror stories, Rich. And I said, I'm going to do it. And unfortunately, I can't tell you what happens when you try to undo it because I never have done that. I, you do get, when you do it, you get some documents that say what you have to do to unfreeze. And the documents don't sound at all onerous to me. But whether it works real well or not, I can't swear to you. Okay, I've not heard any complaints, zero. We may have some people on this call who have experienced it. Maybe the thing to do is if you have a, an opinion on a topic, throw it in the chat so we don't have a long discourse on this particular topic. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Uh, um, as, as, as a retired actuary and Rich is a retired actuary too, I haven't heard about the Hartford Insurance Group auto insurance AARP yet. Yeah, I'm going to talk about products a little bit. Uh, okay. I, I'm no expert okay. on auto insurance, however, except for, pay, except I know how to pay for it. Uh, any other questions? Uh, um, I just wanted to point out that I'm um, chairman of our Tug Group Technology User Group, and we talk about these things frequently. And I have, um, four or five years ago, I locked my credit, as have a number of other old guardians. I, in that time, had to unlock it twice, and it worked very easily. And also, it's no longer a charge. It's free. Oh, good. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, now we're going to get into advocacy. Uh, Joel, go to the next chart, please. Oh no, before we do that, we're gonna do endorsed products. So let's talk about that because you mentioned the Hartford. Um, here is a list. Uh, what's interesting about this list is it doesn't say health insurance, which is the one that most people have. The one that blows me away is down there under insurance. It includes motorcycle insurance. I, I mean, I just have a picture in my head of some 85 year old grandmother on her AARP 
endorse uh, my motorcycle insurance motorcycle. I, I don't know whether she has a pink and white helmet. I don't really know. Anyway, um, the way this works is that there is a, as I said, there is a part of AARP called AARP Services Inc., uh, which is, a, I believe, is an S-Corp, uh, and works with vendors to endorse the products and does provide uh, supervision. They do get people who call who are not happy with what's happened. In addition to calling the vendor, they'll call AARP. Um, you know, again, I don't know how much I can tell you about this. I know that my wife and I have AARP Medigap. Um, we don't have AARP endorsed dental. We have a different dental. Um, you know, you buy like you buy anything else. Um, I did notice, I, I went to the, uh, by the way, a subject that fascinates me is health insurance. Um, I went to, um, on Medicare, I went to the drug uh, comparison tool and I found that my insurance is the cheapest insurance that you can get for equivalent drug uh, coverage, at least among the ones I looked at. And then there are discounts and there are lots and lots and lots of those. And you'll see them in the magazine and, you know, various places. Um, a lot of the companies will advertise a, a senior discount. Uh, and AARP does a lot to get that. Uh, financial services, um, health and wellness. Uh, there's a lot of things. The vendors love to have the AARP label. And if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense because AARP is going to make sure the vendor is giving the customer a square deal. So when you see that AARP label, it stands for something. It isn't just doling out the name and collecting checks. Okay. Uh, all right. Any questions about that? Somebody wanted to talk about the Hartford car insurance. Okay. Let's talk now about advocacy. Uh, next charge all. Okay. What you're going to see there, uh, this is an area where I spent a great deal of time. Uh, I am currently a member of the advocacy team. That's a volunteer group at the state office. There are five of us now, Ken and I, and the current president, and two other people. And we get to talk about the state advocacy. Uh, the staff will come in, they'll present their plans, they'll ask us our opinion, they'll ask us if we think these are good ideas, they'll ask us about how we can implement our advocacy. Who should we press on? How should we do the pressing? Uh, there's a lot of, again, you know, as I said before, there's a large budget. So you will see ads in the ledger and so on uh, from AARP in the Times um, uh, advocating for things, uh, trying to pressure uh, politicians. Um, let me tell you one of our favorite techniques, and I, I just get a bang out of this. Um, one of the things we do is we take volunteers and put these AARP red shirts on them. My red shirt today is not an AARP shirt. It's my own property, I promise and we put these red shirts on people and we bring them to meetings and intimidate politicians. And that's really what happens. They are intimidated. It's really something to see. Um, and I'll tell you my favorite story about it. You've heard imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Um, you notice down there, the second bullet is utilities. Uh, again, that's Ken. I keep talking about Ken because he does do a lot. And Ken comes out of AT&T, so he knows a lot more about utilities. Utilities is probably the most technical subject that we deal with. Uh, and the utility companies' practices have, I've gotten an impression of them that they really need somebody to be advocating against them. I don't know how else to say it than that. Um, one time we were going to uh, a, a meeting. Uh, Ken and I, by the way, will frequently uh, testify before Senate committees, before budget committees, and they ask us to go and do that. And it's a lot more effective coming from a volunteer. And I will tell you the general rule, there is nothing like 
talking to a politician when you are a constituent of that politician. They really listen. Um, so the a congressional volunteer board that I talked about before is organized so that you are talking to your congressman. Anyway, we were in Newark at one of the colleges at this big meeting, and Ken and I were going to testify. And um, we had, you know, 50 or 60 or whatever people with red shirts on. And the door opened. This was the, the uh, our opponent in this was PSENG. The door opened, and in came a parade of PSENG union workers. And they had orange shirts with their logo on them. And I thought, we really have scored something, because now they've created a competing shirt core. Uh, it really works. It's amazing how well it works. We also do a lot of letter writing and email writing and phone calls. Uh, and I do quite a bit of that when they ask me uh, for things that I support. And as I said, I've not really hit things that I don't support. Okay. You'll notice at the top, those are national priorities. Um, affordable prescription drug costs. You are aware that in the current bill that's being debated, that is a big subject, is the uh, Medicare negotiation of prices with the drug companies. Um, AARP is very big on that and is really trying to uh, make that happen, make that stay as part of the bill. As I'm sure you know, there is an effort to remove it from the bill. And I have seen letters and the letters from the top of AARP do not go to some staff guy. The letters go to Nancy Pelosi. Um, and when AARP writes, uh, our the head of our field organization, our advocacy and so on, is Nancy Lamont. And Nancy Lamont's signature on a letter gets some attention. Uh, my only comment about the letters is they're kind of long. But other than that, um, they are extremely impressive. And AARP spends a lot of money on research so that we have a lot of facts at our disposal. Our arguments are very convincing because they're very fact-based. In New Jersey, we have, a, we have a question from Steve Barley. Sure, sure. go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Joel, and thank you, uh, Dave. Uh, Davis, uh, you're well aware the uh, uh, trustees for the Social Security have uh, forecasted that the uh, trust fund that uh, will support payments to uh, old age and survivors uh, is going to be fully funded only until 2033. Uh, what recommendations or what stance does AARP have in terms of uh, filling that uh, problem? Is it uh, okay. uh, increases in, in uh, Social Security taxes, uh, limiting benefits, or uh, general tax increases? Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. That's a very good question and a good example of what we do. Uh, number one, that short-term funding problem is not your big problem. I will come to the big problem, it's Medicare. Social security can be fixed. And I will tell you some of what AARP has done about that. Um, we had a meeting with Senator Menendez and he said to us, um, everybody comes in here and wants me to spend money, but nobody tells me where to get the money from. I said, Senator, here's a folder. And in the folder, there were two brochures one brochure covered Social Security and the other brochure covered Medicare. And both brochures were on the topic of how do you pay for this? The Social Security one is not really that difficult to solve. I'm not saying that we don't have to take action. We do, but it is solvable. Um, we had a meeting here at Lantern Hill on Saturday with Congressman Malinowski, our congressman, and he talked about this issue. Uh, so, for example, one of the strategies uh, is to impose, not increase the tax on us, but impose the tax on higher incomes. Currently, you only pay Social Security tax up to 140000 so that one of the proposals is to reinstate the tax at 400000 That's one example. Um, there are others. I will tell you, Steve, that I remember a meeting in which they gave us a worksheet and it had a list of the various actions that you could take to, um, to uh, close the social security gap. 
and they and they had in it an estimate of how much each of the actions would affect the gap, what percentage of the gap would be closed. And they had us figure out our strategy as individuals for how we would add up these tactics to, to close the gap. And that's quite a while ago, but we did do that. Um, I am not really worried about it. Medicare, that's a different issue. That is a ferociously difficult issue. And you notice that in the current legislation, there, is a, there was an effort to, in, to grow Medicare quite a bit, vision, hearing, and dental. And what has survived as of now is the uh, hearing, which is probably the cheapest of those things, but it doesn't close the gap. As I said, we did publish a brochure on how to close the gap, and I read the brochure, and it had lots of good ideas, but it didn't have the kind of thing I mentioned before with Social Security, where you could actually add up and say, this is how you're going to close the gap. And I am concerned about that. Okay. The, the, of course, the reason I'm not concerned about it is because the ghost of FDR and LBJ still live. And it, you know, it is the third rail of American politics. They're going to find a way to pay for it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you, Dave. I think you're absolutely right. The, the issue with Medicare is we are already taxing everyone on all of their income. So we don't have that easy solution that we have with Social Security. The, the, the um, Medicare negotiation of drug prices would be a big step. And you see the pressure against that. The, and by the way, if there's any place in the world where that pressure exists, it's New Jersey. You know, I, I, uh, when I worked for IBM in my early days, uh, I was in Cranford, and we had half the pharmaceutical business in the United States in that office. Um, I know the other big state is California. So it, that's a real push and pull, and it has not been solved. And in case you haven't noticed it, Congress tends to solve things when their back is exactly against the wall. And it's not, we're not, it's not horrible enough yet. So we have to wait for it to get more horrible. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on. Um, the next one I really am very proud of because I really did work on this one, the CARE Act. This is the problem about a person is in the hospital uh, and they leave the hospital and they're sent away with a smile and a handshake. And that doesn't work. So we passed a law, we, we lobbied for a law uh, called the CARE Act, which does three things. The hospital is required to accept the designation of a caregiver chosen by the patient, to notify the caregiver of discharge or transfer, and to train the caregiver on any medical tasks to be performed at home. Okay? Um, that is a tremendously effective law. Uh, uh, yes, it adds a little more paperwork to hospitals, but as you know, you, uh, you can't barely uh, spot a, a, an additional piece of paper to a hospital. But that's a very good example of something that we did in New Jersey, and it's very effective, and it's been done in other states. Okay, let's move on. Okay, um, the next one is another area where we do a lot of lobbying, uh, advocacy. Uh, energy assistance program. We have three of them in New Jersey for low income people. They have income uh, restrictions to them. Um, they will not surprise you. I have a feeling knowing old guard that we don't have a lot of people who are affected by this, but we do do it and we do also support the supplemental, supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And every time they put it down, they say formerly known as food stamps. And the reason the name was changed was because of the, uh, of the uh, negative uh, aura of the words food stamps. So they keep reminding people of this thing that they don't want to remind people of. I, I don't exactly understand that, but that's how it works. We have, a we have a question from Ron Weinger. Ron, okay, well, you have to unmute. Yeah, uh, I was going to wait till you finished with the uh, particular slide, but uh, I have noticed over the years, uh, well, I don't know, anybody at this time of year, if you've been watching television, you see all these 
ads about how you can get money back on your social security, mm -hmm. how you can get uh, 3,000 different benefits, mm -hmm. and uh, depending on your zip code. But none mm -hmm. of them explain what's going on about how that actually works. And AARP, every year when these things come, AARP is noticeably silent about explaining any of this to you. You know, so you have no idea what, you know, what, what if these ads are scams or why, because yeah. AARP doesn't say anything. And the other thing is uh, when it comes to long term care, AARP is very vocal about how much long term care is going to cost you if you ended up in a nursing home or in a facility, but it never, it has at least in my memory actually gone into what it's cost, what it would cost if you had to actually buy insurance for long-term care and the increasing costs of the insurance and or uh, benefits that are slowly get eroded away. So it seems to be two items that uh, AARP seems to ignore, at least you know, in their newsletters and all the uh, yeah, stuff you get mailed. I never have claimed that they talk about everything they ought to talk about or that they do it effectively. Um, you will notice how many times I have pointed you back to the website. Um, I have found that some of these topics, you go look at the website and you find answers. And I, I have not looked at the ones you're talking about, but I will tell you one that I had an experience with. Does anybody know what a viatical is? A viatical is a kind of distasteful kind of insurance deal where you buy the life insurance policy of a person who's dying. And when they die, you get the money. Uh, you've never heard AARP mention viaticals, ever. I went on, a friend of mine asked me about it because he was offered a deal. I went on the web. I went to AARP and I put viaticals and it popped up. Uh, so before I com commit that we have not commented on these things, I would say you have to check the website. Um, I have been very critical of AARP because I don't think they talk enough about old things. I learned this principle in IBM, when I was with IBM. A bureaucracy wants to talk about new things, not old things. And so they tend to feature the new, whereas the old has a lot of value. And I will tell you again, when you want to talk about any issue that affects seniors, the first thing you ought to do is go to that website and search on whatever that topic is. Okay, now let me come back to your point about all those ads on TV, because I am very aware of all this. This is a subject, as I said before, that I care a great deal about. They are not scams in the sense of, you know, I tell you I'm going to cover you and I don't cover you. That's not what they are. What they are is selective information because they tell you all those benefits, as you said, you are correct. What they don't tell you very much about is that they all involve um, selected medical networks, okay? In other words, you don't get to go to whatever doctor you want to go to. Now, you can read between the lines because when you hear an ad for Medigap insurance, they always say, you can see any doctor who accepts Medicare, which is why my wife and I are on Medigap. We are not on Medicare Advantage. Uh, you, there is a tremendous growth in Medicare Advantage. I was shocked because the last time I had talked about it, it was about 25% of Medicare recipients were on Medicare Advantage. And I just saw a number the other day, it was 44%. So there's a lot of people doing this. And that tells me, again, I have to go back to that, that they're getting a pretty good deal because they can walk away if they want to walk away, and they don't, okay? I, I can't, of course, endorse product XYZ for this or whatever, but that's kind of what goes on with Medicare Advantage. They are saving money by selecting the network. You should also know there are rules within Medicare that the network can't be, uh, you know, a doctor for you in Keokuk, Iowa, and that's your doctor. It uh, has to be doctors uh, that are convenient to you, and it has to cover all the specialties. Those, those are the two rules I know about, okay? Uh, so, as I said, if you'd like, Ron, you and I can go to the website together and look at what AARP has to say about those topics. Okay, I'll go. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll check them out on the website first and then see and send me a note or something you know yeah. okay 
Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I really have told you a lot. Uh, next chart, uh, Joel. I really told you a lot. What really gives AARP its power are the members and the volunteers. The reason the politicians read Nancy Lamont's letters is because she has 38 million members. That's why. The reason we can do advertising is we, we have product revenue from the product licenses as well as uh, membership dues. But there's some other revenue, but those are the two big ones. And that's why we can do, do the advertising and hire the lobbyists and uh, do what we do in, in Congress. I will tell you, my days as president were, as I said, I worked very hard, but I will tell you something very rewarding. Once a year, we would have a meeting in DC of four or five days and we would be meeting and we would have speakers like Jim Clyburn came to speak one time. I mean, we really get people. And then uh, the middle day of the week would be lobby day. They would take all of the state people, each one with its state president and the state staff, and they would bus us up to Capitol Hill. And they would have arranged uh, meetings with, for us with our state's Congress people. And I did this five times. And it, I, I, it's because I am, you're, you're not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, I am very pro-politician. I, having worked with politicians, I am extremely supportive of what they do. I'm sorry for what you read in the paper. I think it's very selective. Um, anyway, I was floating down the hall of the congressional office buildings. It was just really a wonderful thing to do. Uh, have wonderful stories, um, ate in the cafeteria, met with the senators, uh, met with the Congress people. Uh, and I'll give you one example, as I said, about AARP clout. Uh, one of those years, we went to talk to, we took like five or six Congress people for the day. And the, two of our Congress people were on the, uh, the House Armed Services Committee. And they were, the House Armed Services Committee was meeting that day. And there was one of the meeting rooms you see on TV and the TV cameras were on and all of that. And in both cases, they heard AARP was here to meet with them and they came out of the meeting. So there is nothing like the clout that AARP has. And it is very effective. It doesn't mean we win everything. It does not mean that. But we win a lot of stuff and our record, I'm very proud of what we have done to protect, particularly protect Social Security and Medicare, but a lot of these other things too. Um, okay, uh, let me see. And one more chart. Joel, thank you. There's the website. I've told you about the chapters and the volunteers and the Congressional Volunteer Corps about community outreach with things like tax aid and driver safety and the New Jersey Speakers Bureau, things that we do to serve the community. The information we provide, and I will say again, look at your website, you'll be amazed at the information. The products and services we endorse, and I am not selling anything, but I feel very comfortable myself when I buy a product that's endorsed by AARP. And the advocacy, which I think is where the major part of our effort lies. Uh, one more chart. I know you think conclusion means conclusion, but this is a bureaucracy, folks, so there's one more <laughs> chart. Uh, this is the post-conclusion. Um, if you want speakers from the Speakers Bureau to talk about some of this stuff, there's the website. Okay? So now I'm done. Does anybody have any other questions? I'll be happy to uh, try. We have, to question, we have a question from Bill Tittle. Go ahead, Bill. Hey, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, my, my question is, uh, you're doing a lot of, of good things, uh, but uh, because you are nonpartisan, 
there, there's so many important issues that are, well, too hot to handle or you can't, uh, so that, that's too bad. Am I missing something here? Yeah, you're missing something, Bill. It's the same thing I was missing before I got into this. The nonpartisan is what enables us to handle a hot issue. I, I'll give you an example, not to get it too much into politics here, but shortly after I became president, no, excuse me, it was later than that, 2017, 2016, 2017. Um, I was asked to do a presentation in Maplewood for a, a civic organization. And I cannot remember the issue, but on that chart was ARP thanks to Donald Trump for what he had done to support one mm -hmm. of our issues. Okay, mm -hmm. we will support anybody. And what that does is it means when we walk in, they know that we're, we're not gonna do anything for them or against them in voting, but we sure as hell are gonna let everybody know what the issues are, what the right side is, and who did what among the politicians about that issue. And that's what gives us, that's one of the things that gives us the power besides the 38 million members. Great, okay. I have a follow-up question, and that is, it's what I call the intergenerational challenge. I, I feel, and you know, I think people have written about this for forever. Uh, as you get older, you, you, know, you, you kind of get isolated from the rap, rap singers and so forth. <laughs> You're right about that. that. So, is there anything that you do in AARP or, or to try to bridge that kind of gap? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one, and I don't know all of it, but I will tell you part of it. Uh, a few years ago, we were doing a series of seminars uh, on the it was the gubernatorial election. I think we do uh, voter guides, you know, like League of Women Voters do, where we give the politician a chance to answer our questions, and they do video voter guides, they make videotape of the politicians and so on. And we were doing five, uh, no, six uh, events where we were going to talk about the issues in the gubernatorial campaign, and we were doing them at colleges, and I did five of the six. And I remember Ramapo College, I remember Middlesex County College, I don't remember the others, but what we did was we had a mixed audience. We had this, the college kids and the seniors together and talked about how the issues uh, uh, affect each group and what issues are more important to each group. I, I, by no means am I saying that's adequate, but we do do it. Um, the other thing is that you might imagine AARP is pretty eager to get members and the members are, you know, we, we do real well over age 65. We have to work harder at the 50 to 64 and we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Mitch, Mitch Erickson. Yeah, Mitch. Yeah. Hey, Dave, you, you mentioned uh, 1.2 million members in New Jersey and 38 million members in nationwide. Uh, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Uh, but the question is, is what percentage of the eligible membership uh, do we have? It sounds like, you know, at least half of us are, are of us. Oh, eligible. yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know the exact number, but it's at least half. Yeah, I, I, there are competing organizations but they're tiny by comparison, very, very small. Uh, we, as I said, we are the elephant in the room. We are, and we take advantage of that. And can I presume there's a certain amount of uh, SES breakdown where uh, certain SESs are highly represented and others are low, lower representation? Uh, what, uh, what, what? As, as members. In other words, uh, I assume male female is about 50 50. I assume uh, there may be some amount of uh, rich poor uh, bias where rich people are go ahead and 
and buy a membership because it's only whatever it is, 50 bucks a year. And poor people are going to say, nah, I, I got better things to do with my money. No, I, I, first of all, it's 16 bucks a year. It's really cheap. It's like 50 bucks for five years or four years or something like that. Um, I have never heard any discussion of that. What I have been sensitive to, and I haven't even heard this presented this way, is the issue of, of, of non-white minority. And you will see, I mentioned the thing about community outreach. A good part of that is to attract, for example, in Middlesex County, you have a tremendous Asian population. And AARP has been working very hard to attract them. Um, we have, a, now I don't know the numbers, but there are a lot of black people um, Essex County and so on. We have a lot of those people, uh, Hispanic people in Hudson County. I, I think the Asian one was the, like the latest one they were working on, but they're trying, you know, I always laugh about this. I have never met anybody over 50 who hasn't gotten a recruiting letter. Anybody. I mean, they, I don't know how they do it. They have the best damn list you ever saw. I mean, they, <laughs> my kids are over 50. They get them, you know, and they give me a hard time. They don't want to join and, you know, all of that. Um, no, we, they work, you know, I don't really know how ARP got to be as successful as it is. What I know is that in order to stay that successful, you better keep working at it. And they do. I We were in Washington and I saw their communications capabilities and it's really impressive. Um, I will tell you, the other day, my wife and I in the Lantern Hill mail room ran into a copy of the Reader's Digest. I hadn't seen one in years. Now, years and years and years ago when I had hair, the Reader's Digest was the largest circulation magazine in the world. A few years later, bless Mr. Annenberg, TV Guide became the largest circulation magazine in the world. And the last I knew, the largest circulation magazine in the world was the AARP magazine. Uh, it tells you about demographics and it tells you about AARP, AARP being successful. Any other questions? This yeah, just to follow up. First of yeah. all, uh, somebody should do the experiment and the day they turn 50, they should join ARP and see if they still get all those letters. And secondly, <laughs> yeah. you know, when I get the ARP magazine, it always makes me feel old because there's all these people that I thought were youngsters, that, you, know, right. Uh, you right. know, Jamie Lee Curtis and whatnot, and you go, oh, wow. Anyway, yeah. th right. thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Anything else? Uh, this is uh, Rich Jager, Dave. Um, uh, I, I admit that I have not become an AARP member, and uh, my my excuse is uh, one of Newton's laws, uh, something about inertia. Um, but when when you're making the pitch to people like me, okay, you should do it. You know, I can see AARP does a lot of good stuff, and sounds like there's a lot of good information on the website. What, what are the couple of bullet points that you give people like me? You know, this is why you should join AARP. Oh, Rich, that, that question, I have toiled with that question for years. Um, the fact is, what I said earlier, that pretty much um, all of the information and benefits are available to everybody, which says, why should I join? Well, one reason, and I think it may have changed this, but at one point, you had to be a member to get the endorsed insurance. And I remember seeing ads where it said, you know, if you're not an AARP member, ask the vendor, the, the health insurance vendor, we'll tell you how to be a member. But they give you a piece of paper and that and $16 and you're a member. I mean, it's not a big deal. Um, I, my wife and I are you know, long-term, five-year-at-a-time kind of members. The reason we're members is because it's the right thing. It, it not, I don't, I, it is also true, as I said, I think when we got the insurance, you had to be a member, but we had been members before that. Uh, my view of it is you, you really are part of doing the right thing. You are going to get like the magazine and that kind of stuff, but it's really more 
supporting what is really a very fine organization, I think. Anything else? Well, I'm very happy to have done this. Um, I, I enjoy talking with you guys a lot. Um, and I'm done. Everybody have a great Thanksgiving. I'm Tom Shevsky. Yeah, OK. Uh, David, I'd like to thank you. And we've got, uh, uh, for all the information you gave us, I especially wish I would have known about the Speakers Bureau ahead of time, because I had a little problem finding the speakers for my month. So that was a good tip. And um, and all the services that are offered, even to non-members. I know one time I called uh, about some insurance and I was expecting to get a plug for their insurance. And no, the woman basically was very honest and very knowledgeable about giving me the information I needed. So anyhow, with that, I'd like to tell you that we have two ways of thanking our, our member speakers. And uh, the one I'm with, which I'm sure you're familiar, is the certificate, uh, the coveted certificate of appreciation, uh, which we give to every member. And the second is our old guard salute. Um, I, I forgot about telling you about the orchid, but I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, Put it in so, my hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyhow, we're going to give you the old guard salute and thank you. It was very informative. Thank you very much. Um, I, if I can just tag on out of order, back to the question, I'm sorry, I don't remember who asked me about what does AARP say about the pros and cons of Medicare Advantage and all that. I just went over to the website and typed Medicare Advantage and I've got original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. That's a, that's a video that you can see. The big choice, original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. All this stuff is there. Okay. <laughs> Medicare Advantage plans are increasingly popular. That's from October 6th of this year. So jump on guys, to, you know, take advantage. And thank you very much for your uh, comments. Um, I enjoyed doing this very much with you. Uh, I noticed the day that uh, our, the Lantern Hill sales director, Brian Cassidy gave his Lantern Hill pitch uh, I've commented several times to the staff here, the questions you guys ask are really good questions. They're really worth talking about. So I appreciate that. Hey, thank you a lot, Dave. You're welcome. <laughs>